Hi, my name is Steve Witten. I am happily married to Keely, and we've got two children. I was brought up in South London, in Camberwell, uh, in a Christian home, and my parents taught me all about Jesus from a young age. We attended a little independent evangelical church uh, on a council estate in Camberwell, um, and my whole life seemed to revolve around church. I absolutely loved it. I put my faith in Jesus when I was uh, seven years old, so I've been serving him now for 31 years. I have, of course, let the Lord down repeatedly in that time. Uh, growing up in South London meant you had to be tough, um, and so living a faithful Christian life didn't really fit with the image I was trying to present at school. So I let God down a lot in my late teens and early 20s, but graciously, he stuck with me. I'm pleased to say that Jesus is my King and my Saviour. He's paid the price for my sin and he's rescued me from a lost eternity. I owe him everything. I'm really blessed now. I get paid to tell people about Jesus. I'm the assistant pastor at Kenton Evangelical Church in Harrow. My new church family are great and I've been really blessed and learned so much in the two years that I've been training there. I've just finished my second year at Cornhill and I plan to go back for year three. And in the long run, uh, my plan is to take on a church of my own. So after Cornhill's finished, that's exactly what we're looking to do. So if people could pray that I would make the most of my final year at Cornhill and God would open up doors and make it uh, very plain about where he wants me and my family to serve him. Thank you very much. The Cornhill Training Course exists to equip individuals to handle the Bible correctly and to preach and teach it faithfully, relevantly and engagingly. Since the Proclamation Trust started Cornhill back in 1991, we've trained well over 1,200 men and women for word-centered ministry, the great majority of whom have gone on to a lifetime of teaching God's word, both here in the UK and around the world. In 2016, we reformatted the Cornhill training course in order to serve a wider variety of people. Now our family of courses across three year groups is designed to cater to everyone from the committed church member through to the individual moving towards full-time word ministry. Our students come from all walks of life. We have people who are doing church apprenticeships alongside training with us. We have recently retired people who want to be better equipped to serve in their churches. We have employed people who have rearranged their working week to study with us for one day. We have occasional preachers who want to hone their preaching, people involved in youth and children's ministry, women's ministry, or seeking to do missionary work abroad. We have students who have done theology degrees and others who didn't finish secondary school. We have international students who come to us from overseas to be taught in order to then train others back in their home countries. It's a wide variety of students and teachers united in our goal of helping each other to better handle and teach God's word in whatever context the Lord has placed us. This coming academic year from September, we are excited to offer the first year of Cornhill online. So in this coming year, you can join us for Foundation Year One, wherever you are, without any need to travel into London. This is partly a response to the current crisis, but something that we are glad to embrace and make the best of. Cornhill Foundation Year One can be a standalone course and will be useful to you no matter who you are. We'd love you to apply, we'd love to meet you, and if you want more information and to find out how to apply, visit the Proclamation Trust website.
Hello everybody. My name's David Seckington and I'm the Assistant Pastor at Trinity Church Central London. Before Cornhill, I used to work in the sports industry, selling sponsorship for Brazil and England football teams uh, and then working in extreme sports. Cornhill taught me so much, um, but perhaps three main things. Uh, the biggest was I learned just how amazing God and the gospel are. I think I found every single day a great encouragement to my own faith. Secondly, I started to understand how the unfolding story of the Bible fits together, uh, which was a wonderful thing. And then thirdly, I learned tools for life to help understand what the Bible writers were saying to their audiences and how to then preach that to people in our day. Cornhill was amazing for me uh, in both strengthening my own faith and love for God and then also giving me tools to preach and teach the scriptures to others. Thank you for offering to pray for me. Uh, please pray that I remain faithful in proclaiming God's truth until the end of my days, whatever life throws at me. The bookstore at EMA is always a hive of activity. Uh, you've got those who get there early looking to snap a bargain while it's there. Uh, there are others who um, just carefully browse and take some recommendations. And with one minute before closing on the final day, are just about ready to make their purchases. We're gutted that we can't do it physically this year, but whether you're the impulse buyer or the slow plodding thinking buyer, if you visit tenofthose.com forward slash EMA, you'll find a bunch of EMA recommendations, all at discounts, all at special prices, which you can buy individually, or if you buy our day's recommendations as a bundle, you're going to save even more. We're even going to have exit books, uh, though you'll have to check out uh, to get your books for a pound. We'll explain more about that later. But our passion for this bookstore, whether it's physically or online, is to resource you as ministers, as missionaries, as Christians seeking to live for Jesus and reach the world for Christ. We want to equip you with good resources that are going to point you to Jesus and won't break the bank balance as you do it. So visit tenofthose.com forward slash EMA and we'd love to serve you with good resources. Welcome to the final day of EMA Online. My name is Nigel Stiles and I'm the director of the Cornhill Training Course here at the Proclamation Trust. We've had a great first two days together and we continue to pray that our morning will be a blessing to you and bring glory and honour to the Lord Jesus. EMA Online is run with the express purpose of encouraging and equipping you for word ministry. 
We've been amazed by all the messages that have come in from across the UK and all over the world. It's amazing that we can come together united in the gospel and our common goal of serving the Lord Jesus by holding out his word of life. One of my responsibilities at PT is running the Cornhill training course. It's a course that has one express aim. We want to train people to study the Bible and to teach it to others in the local church and beyond. We have over 200 students across three year groups. All kinds of people come to Cornhill from all around the world. Some are setting out on a trajectory towards full-time ministry. Some simply want to be equipped to be more useful in their local church. Others come to be trained in order to train others. We have a thrilling variety of students from the UK and internationally and are so encouraged by them and trust their time with us will propel them forward in ministry. This coming academic year from September, we are excited to offer the first year of Cornhill online. So in this coming year, you can join us for Foundation Year One, wherever you are, without any need to travel into London. This is partly a response to the current crisis, but something that we are glad to embrace and make the best of. Cornhill Foundation Year One can be a standalone course and will be useful to you no matter who you are. We'd love you to apply. We'd love to meet you. And if you want more information and to find out how to apply, visit the Proclamation Trust website. This morning, we're going to be hearing from Andrew Satch. Andrew is one of the tutors here at Cornhill and is also co-pastor of Grace Church, Greenwich, London. Our morning is split into three sessions. First, exegesis, where Andrew is going to show us his working on the passage. Secondly, exposition, where Andrew will preach an expository sermon on the passage. Thirdly, explanation, where Andrew will answer the questions that we all submit. The way to submit questions is on your screen now. Please will you also fill in the YouTube comments box with who you are and where you're watching this broadcast. We'd love to hear from you. You can also make use of Facebook, Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag EMA online. There's also a booklet to accompany the conference. Details of where to download it are also on the screen now and also in the video information for this broadcast. We hope it's a really encouraging and helpful morning. Thank you for coming. Let me pray. And then I'm going to hand it over to Andrew. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have breathed out everything that we read in the Bible. And thank you that as we read it today, you will be teaching us and rebuking us and correcting us and training us in righteousness. Please would you do that for our good, for the good of those that we serve, and for the advance of the gospel. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to Andrew. This is the first eight verses of 2 Kings, chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Ella, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was, what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory, from Watchtower 
to fortified city. Well, good morning and thanks for tuning in. And I'm going to be looking together with you at one of my favourite passages in the Old Testament, the story of King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18 and 19. And the idea of this first session is I'm going to work through it with you the way I would do in my study as I'm trying to get to grips with it. And then a bit later on, you'll hear the sermon that was the outcome of this work. So I've put on the iPad some of the steps that I always go through and that we're going to go through together. And the first one is um, familiarity, which is to say that you've no chance of understanding a passage of the Bible unless you read it. I mean, obviously, but actually you want to read it several times. And if I was preaching this in a fortnight, I might try and read it once a day for the next two weeks, because just by reading it 14 times, you're 14 times more familiar. And it turns out you understand it 14 times more. Now, we haven't got a chance to do that now. It's too long to read. So if you're watching this live, then I'm sorry about that. If you're watching this not live, then maybe this is the time to pause the video, go away, read 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19, and then pick up the story. Let me give you a, a sort of rough guide to what's going on. It's a, it's a story of a siege by the king of Assyria, who shows up with his army of 185,000 people around the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and he threatens to destroy them. He's got a good track record. We read he's already swept away the whole of the northern kingdom of Samaria. He's already swept away the many of the other fortified cities in Judah. Um, I guess the most famous one is um, Lachish. I always remember it like a French pastry. Um, but the, you might have seen in the British Museum the frieze of the army of Assyria turning up uh, with all of their chariots and their um, archers and so on and uh, besieging Lachish, which they took. And now they arrive at Jerusalem itself. And it's a crisis. It will Judah be wiped off the map? But by the end of chapter um, 19, the crisis is averted. Let me read you the final paragraph of chapter 19. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When people arose early in the morning, looking nervously over their city wall, behold, all the dead bodies. And so they're spared. So it's a, a great crisis and then a great victory. You might think it's quite a big part of the Bible to take in one go. Um, why not do a shorter sermon, you know, two whole chapters? Actually, it has to be two chapters because that is the length of the story. The attack begins at the beginning of chapter 18 and the victory is won at the end of chapter 19. But what is taken up by all this space? Mainly it is talking, it is speeches. Speeches by the Rabshakeh, who's the representative of the king of Assyria as he comes and attacks. Um, the response of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and then the words of the prophet Isaiah as he speaks into the situation. Now, um, we, that's, we're not very familiar with it yet, but um, as I've been reading it and reading it and reading it, the next step is to look for the structure. And it's particularly important with a, a really long narrative like this to try and get a handle of what is going on scene by scene. How does the plot develop? What is the shape of the story? Because just to give people two whole chapters, they're not going to be able to cope with it but if we can sort of zoom back and see how it works as a whole. So I've been doing some work on the, the structure and you probably won't be able to read this because it's super, super small, but um, I'm just gonna scribble on it as I uh, worked out what was going on in each section. So it begins, as I said, with a little intro to Hezekiah in which we're told, for example, that his mum's name was Abby, that he reigned for 29 years and significantly that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So King Hezekiah gets a thumbs up from the author. He is a good king. But then we get the crisis, and here is the attack of the Assyrians near the start of the story. And then that is matched by the victory at the very end of the story. And in between, I noticed that the, the different scenes seem to be controlled by different characters who they relate to. So um, the first up is the Rabshakeh who is the spokesman of the king of Assyria, and he gives us a very, very long speech. And then we hear from King Hezekiah and his reply, he's the king of Judah. And then we hear from the prophet Isaiah, who comes to um, speak to strengthen Hezekiah, Isaiah said. And then we go around again. We then get the Rabshakeh giving another speech, and then we get Hezekiah responding again. And then we get Isaiah giving another word of the Lord. 
Now this is really interesting to me because it I just realized it's suddenly a very carefully ordered narrative. Uh, it's not the story told haphazardly, it's the story told as we look at the Rabshka um, attacking, then we hear from Hezekiah the king, then we hear from the prophet, then we hear from the Rabshka attacking, then we hear from Hezekiah the king, then we hear from the prophet. It's, it's three cycles um, and then the conclusion of the victory. So we're already starting to see some sort of shape and handle on the whole thing. And I've tried to show you the whole of this in um, by color coding the, the reading. So here it is um, on the iPad. Again, probably too small to see, but you can probably pick out the colors. So we've done a little bit of familiarity. We've looked at the structure. The next stage is to look for um, repetition or emphasis, because sometimes if the author wants to get your attention, he says something more than once. Sometimes if the author wants to get your attention, he says something more than once. I make no apology for these annoying ditties because uh, people will remember them, hopefully. So uh, let's zoom in on the first of the Rabshakeh's speeches and we'll discover that there is a great emphasis on faith. Verse 19, the Rabshakeh said to them, to the people in the city of Jerusalem, say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on whom do you rest this trust of yours? Verse 20, in whom do you trust that you've rebelled against me. Verse 21, you are trusting in Egypt, which is, I guess, a mistake, but the idea that maybe they might turn to a military alliance to help them against Assyria. Um, you shouldn't trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, well, that's not gonna work either, he says. And then um, a little bit later on, do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. Don't let your king convince you to put your faith in God, he says. In other words, his whole propaganda is a sustained attack on faith. You would be mad to trust in God faced with my army, he's saying. Now, um, then we look at the intro to the whole thing as the author introdu introduces Hezekiah. And along with telling us his mum's name was Abby and he reigned for 29 years and he was a good king, he also says this about Hezekiah. This is in the intro. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. So Hezekiah, in other words, is the most trusting king of all time. You go before him, you can't find anyone who trusts God that much. After him, no one to beat his record. He is the one who trusts. So this emphasis on faith, it seems to be the thing that the author is showcasing about the, um, the incident. Hezekiah is a trusting king. The Rabshakeh attacks his trust. Now, armed with that, that, the author's kind of given us a lens then on the action. He's not just telling us what happened. He's saying, this is what happened. Look at it through the lens of trust. So on with that, I'm now going back to the structure and seeing if I can work out how these different cycles relate to the theme of trusting God. And I'm gonna um, characterize it this way. So the Rabshakeh actually um, undermines trust. That's what all his speeches are about. But it doesn't work because he and King Hezekiah in, in response, he exercises faith. And then Isaiah speaks, why do we get a word from the Lord here? I think the word of the Lord functions to strengthen faith. He says, don't worry, Hezekiah, God's gonna come through for you. All I'm doing is um, using this lens that the author's given me to try and understand each scene and how it relates to that. Then we get that Rabshka comes up again, and again, he tries to undermine faith. And then Hezekiah um, exercises faith. And then Isaiah once again strengthens faith. And then we get the victory, but I'm gonna now cast the victory again through this lens of faith, and I'm gonna say it's the vindication of faith. In other words, it wasn't just an, an empty wishful thinking thing to trust in the Lord, because the Lord really did come through. And then when all the armies struck down in the morning, you really realize, oh yeah, God was fighting for us. We were right to have trusted him. Faith vindicated. So it's all coming together actually, it's working together as one. And um, now I'm in a position to come up with the structure of the sermon because the author's really given me that structure. I've just discovered the structure that's there in the narrative itself and the structure of the sermon is gonna fall out. So here's what I came up with. 
Um, the big story is the attack at the beginning and the battle won at the end, although I'm going to call this battle won faith vindicated. And then in between these three cycles, the Rabshaka, Hezekiah, Isaiah, the Rabshaka, Hezekiah, Isaiah, but the Rabshaka undermines faith. Hezekiah exercises faith, Isaiah strengthens faith, and then round again. Of course, we need to ask the question, why do we go round again? Why have the whole thing twice? And I guess it's because the thing about faith is it gets harder to trust if you have to trust for longer, or if you have to wait for longer, or if the threats get worse while you're trusting in God. And so the key thing about Hezekiah's faith is not just that he believes, but that he keeps believing right the way until he sees the Lord um, deliver him uh, in the end. Um, and this raises some questions, doesn't it, about how we tackle it. So I guess we want to go through the story arc. So we start at the beginning, we end at the end. But also we might want to do some comparisons because the Rabshaka we come gets twice. Is, is there any progression in what we learn about the Rabshaka? Or we get Hezekiah's response twice. Is there any response in progression in the way that Hezekiah responds and so, and so on with Isaiah? So let's look at the Rabshaka again and um, briefly. And as we've seen, it's an attack on faith. We look close at the details. We discover that his propaganda war works in lots of different ways. There's lots of different ways in which he tries to chip away at Hezekiah's trust. Let's just look at a couple of them now. For example, this one in verse 31. Um, make your peace with me and come out to me. Each of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree. Each one of you will drink the water of his own system. In other words, he's saying the king of Assyria will bless you. Don't trust in the Lord to bless you. I'll bless you. Now, that's particularly interesting because um, we recognise the allusion from earlier in the book of one and two kings. Each one of you will eat of his own vine, each of his own fig tree. Back in one kings under the reign of King Solomon, Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine, all under his fig tree. So this is a reminder of the glory days that they lost and the, and the Rabshakeh is offering to put things right himself. So if you realise that your nation's going to decline, who are you going to look to to save you? I'll save you, he says. Don't trust in God to save you. Um, I'll be the one that restores your fortunes. And actually, these are distinctively covenant blessings, blessings of God's covenant. But the Rabshakeh is saying, you can get those from me rather from God. So he's not just saying, stop trusting in God. He's saying, trust in me instead of trusting in God. Because after all, I've got a lot of soldiers. Just look over the wall. That's the Rabshakeh. Let's look now at Hezekiah's response. And I want us to compare the two Hezekiah sections that we saw in the structure. And we discover something really interesting, that there seems to be a progression between the two. So the first one, as soon as King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes, which is a way of saying, I'm really upset. And he goes into the house of the Lord, which in one and two kings is distinctively the place of prayer. And the temple is, um, the particular emphasis on the temple in 1 Kings 8 is about it being the place where God will hear you. So he goes to the place where God hears, but he doesn't actually pray. He says to Isaiah, please will you pray? So some, maybe you've experienced this, that you've got a friend who doesn't know the Lord Jesus, but they know that you do, and they think you have some kind of hotline to, to God. So they ask you, please, would you pray for me? That, that's what King Hezekiah does. He goes to Isaiah and says, you're the religious guy. Please, will you say a prayer for me? But when we look at the second response of um, Hezekiah, we find that Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. There's a progression from asking Isaiah to pray to praying himself. And because we know that the big theme is faith, I think you'd have to say from this, Hezekiah's faith actually grows during the episode. He trusts God more than he did earlier. Here's another um, little nugget from Hezekiah's prayer. Um, and it's a direct response to part of the propaganda. So the, the Rabshika says, let me read to you chapter 18, verse 33. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath, Arpad, Sepharim, Hena, Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. So what he's saying is, I've got a good track record here. I've defeated a lot of other countries and they've all been religious countries. They've all had gods to pray to. Let me tell you, their gods did not help them. What makes you think your God's any different? 
But Hezekiah, in his prayer, he shows that he realizes something theologically that the Rabshakeh did not realize. Uh, follow it with me. And this time we'll look at the linking words. I think um, I was taught at the Cornhill training course that whenever you see the word therefore, you should ask what it is there for, and we'll see why. So 2 Kings 19, Hezekiah's prayer. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. It's true. For, linking word, because they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. That was where they're quite flammable, at least the wood ones were quite flammable. And because people just made them in a workshop, they weren't actually gods. Therefore, they were destroyed. And Hezekiah realises that this is not the same kind of case because now we're dealing with the living God, not a fake idol, but the true God. Um, we've looked at the Rabshakeh, we've looked at Hezekiah, let's now look at um, Isaiah. And what we're trying to do at this stage, having seen the overall shape of it, we're just drilling down into little scenes, seeing some little extra details or nuggets that help us. And there's a little delicious little irony here um, Isaiah says, don't be afraid because of the words you've heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I'll put a spirit in him so he'll hear a rumour and return to his own land. I'll make him fall by the sword in his own land. In other words, the Rabshakeh's army is going to be unsettled by a rumour. And that's exactly what happens. He hears that there's another battle brewing back home. Uh, but it's a great irony because we were told in the beginning of the Rajka speech, do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? And the answer is yes. I mean, all you're giving us is words. Um, it's then a battle of, of words. And in fact, it's words that unsettle you and cause you to run back home um, before finally the angel of the Lord turns up and 185,000 of them are killed. So we've tried to get familiar with the text. We've looked for the structure um, which has been a real help because the author structure has given us our sermon structure. We've found the repetition, the emphasis that's given us the lens. It's all actually all about faith. So we're starting to see how the whole thing works together. We've got two more steps and they're all about how we get from the world of one and two kings, in this case a battle that happened in 701 BC to 2020 AD. How do we read this as Christians in the light of the coming of the Lord Jesus. And actually we need to break that down. There's two things we need to do. Firstly, we need to set this in Bible history, both within the history of one and two kings as a book, and then in the place of the whole Bible story. But then also we need to ask the question, who am I? Which I don't mean some sort of existential crisis. I mean, where do I fit into the story? Where do I as a Christian step into someone's shoes? Um, am I supposed to be Hezekiah or you know, something else? I've tried to draw a diagram showing the whole of one and two kings. Let me just explain how it works. So the crowns are kings. I haven't put all of them down, but some of the most famous ones, King David, and then his son, King Solomon, in the real glory days of Israel, when the temple was built, when all the nations came, the Queen of Sheba came to see the wisdom of Solomon and all the prosperity of this nation who God had blessed. Um, King Hezekiah, who's our hero uh, today. King Manasseh, his son, who was very, very evil. King Josiah, who's another hero. Um, they're the kings. And, and then the line there shows Israel and whether they're doing well, which is the line going up, or whether they're doing badly, which is the line going down. And they're, they're at their height in the days of Solomon, but then things begin to go downhill and the kingdom splits in half um, and uh, into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, Israel goes downhill quickest and goes off to exile in 722 BC to Assyria. And we, we actually read about that at the beginning of our passage, a little recap of how um, Sennacherib's predecessor, Shalmaneser, took Samaria. Um, but things in Judah also go downhill, not quite as fast. Um, and then they rally a bit when we get King Hezekiah, because King Hezekiah is a faithful king and the fortunes of Judah really improve. He trusts God, he leads the people to trust God, things go a bit better. Um, but his successor, Manasseh, his son Manasseh, is the most evil king and things go badly downhill. Manasseh does great evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, just some awful, awful things happen during his reign. Then we get one other really good king, King Josiah. 
Um, Josiah is a reformer. He rediscovers the book of the law and urges people to repent and to turn back to the Lord and live his way. But it's not enough. And what Josiah does cannot um, fix the problem of the evil of Manasseh. And so the whole country of Judah also goes into exile, this time to Babylon in 686-687 BC. So um, here's the story. And I put here on the diagram, you are here. In fact, you aren't here because you're in 2020, like I am, um, after the coming of the Lord Jesus. But the first reader of 1 and 2 Kings is here because here's the story of the whole book. And by definition, it was published at the end of the story. Um, it's not sort of predicting the future, it's telling the story of what had happened. And so they're reading it in exile after it's all gone wrong. So as imagine a first reader of 1 and 2 Kings when it's hot off the shelves in the water stones of Babylon and they're turning the pages thinking, what does this mean for us? And basically it's a story of how do we get ourselves into this mess? Because things were great back in Solomon's day, but now they're really messed up. What was it that went wrong? What went wrong is that they rebelled against God. They didn't trust God. They turned to idols. They did evil things. Um, but they did look back on the Hezekiah story as a time when there was a bit of hope because things really rallied. Things started to be a bit better because of Hezekiah. A king who trusted God, who led his people to trust God, was the hope of the country. Um, the only sad thing is that Hezekiah didn't live forever because after King Hezekiah came an evil king, Manasseh, who messed everything up. Um, I've put here the plus 15... This is an allusion to chapter 20 of Two Kings, the one after our chapter, where King Hezekiah's reign gets extended for 15 years. And God makes it really clear in chapter 20 that Hezekiah living for a bit longer is also the nation of Judah living for a bit longer. An extension of Hezekiah's reign, and it's a miraculous thing, he's cured of a disease, and then God literally turns back a sundial, which is an amazing miracle. It either means God rotated the earth on, on its axis the other way, or he moved the sun, or he changed the properties of light, or some pretty crazy sort of physics bending miracle to literally extend time for Hezekiah, 15 years. And for, for all of those 15 years, they do okay. And I suppose the first reader is thinking, if only we had Hezekiah not just for 15 years longer, but for infinitely longer. As long as we've got a Hezekiah on the throne, things are okay. And as soon as Hezekiah's gone, Things are lost. And so they're wistfully looking back thinking what we really wanted, what we really need is a Hezekiah who trusts God, but who lives forever. Now, um, having done that work, we now ask the who am I question. Whose shoes do I step into? And I hope by this point it's pretty obvious because I am not the king who lives forever and neither are you. <laughs> and that job is taken. That is the Lord Jesus. Hezekiah prefigures Jesus. Jesus also trusted God when under extreme pressure of trial. In Jesus' case, it wasn't the Rabshakeh who um, tried to undermine him. It was Satan himself as he was tested in the wilderness. But the tactics are very similar. Do you remember how the Rabshakeh says, I'm the one who can give you blessing. Get your blessing from me, not from God. Well, that's exactly what the devil says to Jesus. I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. But the Lord Jesus instead continues to trust his father, even though that path meant going to the cross. So Jesus is very Hezekiah-like, or you might say Hezekiah is very Jesus-like as a prefiguring of, of Jesus. But the difference is Jesus is never going to hand over to a successor who will mess everything up like Hezekiah had to do when he died. Jesus is the faithful king who lives forever, which gives us great security. But we don't have to stop there because the Lord Jesus in his trust of God, we're told in the New Testament, is a model for us. Um, he's a saviour of us uniquely, but he's also a model for us. Just as Jesus trusted his father, so we ought to trust God. Um, and that point is made, for example, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And the whole paragraph is about that being an example that we should follow. Now that helps, I think, because it means that now 1 and 2 Kings can speak more immediately to us 
because Hezekiah is a model of Jesus and Jesus is a model for us, that means that some of the characteristics of Hezekiah are things that we should copy. We should copy them as they're fulfilled in Jesus. Hezekiah's trust is something we should imitate. And it might be that we then discovered that some of the attacks of the Rabshakeh, just as they prefigured the attacks on Jesus' faith, are also the attacks on our faith. And so even though we've taken the long route to get there, we've gone from the, the first reader of 1 and 2 Kings, um, we see that they were longing for an eternal Hezekiah. Then we've seen that the eternal Hezekiah has come, the Lord Jesus. But then we've seen that the eternal Hezekiah is a model for the Christian. Now I can start responsibly to put myself back into the, the story. Actually, I'm not Hezekiah, but maybe I should respond like him. I should respond like Jesus in testing. Maybe I can recognise some of the particular battles as the Rabshakeh's voice is heard even today as secular voices employ very much the same strategies of propaganda against the Christian. Maybe I can be strengthened as Hezekiah was, as Jesus was by the word of God. Just as Isaiah speaks, Hezekiah keeps trusting. Just as the scriptures spoke and Jesus kept trusting. So even as I read my Bible, I can keep trusting in the face of the mockers. Let's just recap the steps we've gone through. We've tried to get familiar with the text. Um, then we looked at the structure, which is really important for a long passage like this. And um, we're trying to see how all the different bits fit together. And we found the structures very carefully put together, these two cycles, which actually have given us the structure of the sermon. Um, and we saw that the author isn't just recording history, but he's also giving us the interpretation of history. He's giving us a lens to look through. Um, the lens of his emphasis was about faith. Um, and so we brought that to bear on the structure. We saw how the whole thing started to fit together. And then the final stage was working out how we get from the story of one and two kings in, in this case, 701 BC, this battle, to today in 2020 AD. And we saw that we need to first step into the shoes of the first readers in exile. What does it mean for them? They were longing for an eternal Hezekiah. They wanted a Hezekiah who would last. We then zoomed out a bit. We thought, well, we know who that is. That's the Lord Jesus. And primarily it's appointed to him. But then we saw finally that because Jesus is our example, then Hezekiah can indirectly be our example. We can put ourselves into those shoes. That's the method we should go through, the right order, to go from the first reader through the Lord Jesus to the Christian. Um, but, and I, we shouldn't try and short circuit that. But when I preach it, I think I'm gonna do it the other way around. I'm going to start with the ways in which the Rabshakeh's voice is heard in the secular world today and how we, like Hezekiah, like the Lord Jesus, but I won't mention the Lord Jesus, how we, like Hezekiah, can uh, continue to trust God, how the Isaiahs of this world, the, the scriptures, can strengthen us. I'll do that first because of the kind of immediate connection with the Christian, and then I'm going to save the Lord Jesus until the end of the sermon. He's the one I got to first in my preparation, but he's going to be the one I, I mentioned last in the preaching so that the emphasis and the final um, glory goes to him. The Panoramic Bible New Testament is an innovative format of Bible to aid the reader in their study. It is a square 27 centimetre design on 120 gram paper between a cloth overboard, silver embossed hardcover. It is beautifully designed on the inside with lots of space for taking notes and formatted in such a way that the 17 short books of the New Testament all fit across a double page. Not only that, but the 10 longer books are divided into preaching units to help the reader get a handle on the thrust of each section of scripture. Never before has the ESV anglicised version been so inviting to grapple with, nor the task of exegesis been better catered for in a Bible. We really think that this is a great resource for preachers and teachers of God's Word, along with anyone who loves studying the Bible. Our other aim was price. We wanted it to be beautiful, yet affordable, and you'll be surprised how little it costs to get this into your hands and the hands of your congregation. Hi, I'm Ben Slee, and I want to invite you to dwell richly. 
a new online course to equip music leaders and musicians to lead sung worship in the local church. Through videos, study notes and discussion questions, we'll explore some of the key aspects of theology and practice surrounding music and worship, so that we as music leaders are best prepared to serve the people of God that we're gathered with each Sunday by helping the gospel dwell richly in them. Sign up today for this free resource at musicministry.org. It was a normal routine of going to Sunday school, joining youth meetings, and being involved in Christian activities. But I knew in my heart that I was attracted by the life of my friends in the world. I wanted to also have my freedom, having a girlfriend that I could move around and enjoy life together. But there was this fear in my heart 
the fear of the consequences of that life on my future. I have this belief that God will not show me favor if I don't live well. So I was caught in these two worlds, being in the church, but also wanting to go out and enjoy life. This was my world when I entered uni in 2008. And when I entered, I said to myself, it's time to put God on hold and enjoy life on campus. But I met a roommate whose personal devotional life really challenged me. That was when I began asking myself, am I really a serious Christian? And I knew very little of God's word at that time. So I asked my friend to help me. He woke me up every dawn to pray and gave me his personal study Bible to read. As I kept reading the Bible day after day, God began building a desire in my heart for his word. And it was through this journey of reading God's word that Jesus took hold of my heart and opened my soul to his love. And when I fell in love with Jesus, I became an unstoppable street preacher. I left university with a heart that was so passionate to share Jesus in my neighborhood, my workplace, my church. I couldn't resist the desire of making Jesus known to my friends and colleagues.
Hi there, I'm Tom from the UK. Um, I led a Bible study before I joined Cornhill at my local church, uh, particularly with internationals working in London. And I also had a full-time job working as a civil servant in Westminster. I came to Cornhill to learn the Bible better myself and also to meet other people who were serving in their local churches and to test the waters myself whether or not working full-time for a church was something which I could do. Since starting at Cornhill, I continue to lead a Bible study group at church and occasionally get the chance to preach, so lots of good opportunities to put into practice what we learn about how to teach the Word of God to others. I also still work four days a week um, at my day job and lots of opportunities there to tell other people about Jesus. In terms of next steps, I'm stepping back from my day job next year and to allow me to take the third year of Cornhill and also to train and to work at my church. And in the long term, I'd love to support gospel work, particularly to people where gospel is lacking, to give them the opportunity to respond to Jesus, to know the living God, to have hope in the face of death and judgment, and to have eternal life in his name. If you'd like to pray for me, do pray that I would use the training now and the time that I have to boldly declare the good news and the great works of God among the nations. Thank you very much. The Proclamation Trust exists to help people unashamedly preach and teach God's word, the Bible. We believe that this is the most important task in the whole world. It's through the faithful proclamation of God's word that the lost are found Christians are nourished and churches are edified. We've all benefited from the ministry of the Proclamation Trust in one way or in another, and by God's grace, we want to see it continue and thrive and expand. We have exciting plans to train many more people for word ministry through our Cornhill training course. We want to enhance our support of people already in ministry through our conferences and resources. We want to maximise the opportunities that digital media presents and be generous to other ministries, both in the UK and around the world. God has been so faithful to the Proclamation Trust over the last four decades, providing resources to enable the ministry through generous gospel partners. Now, in 2020, we are more determined than ever to seize new opportunities and redouble our efforts to equip and encourage people to keep on preaching and teaching the Bible. We would love you to partner with us in this vital work. You can give by text or via our giving portal on the website. You can give a one-off gift or commit to regular giving over the longer term. Please give what you can and be assured that all money that is given will be used to equip and encourage Bible teachers on the front line of gospel ministry. Thank you for your ongoing prayers and partnership.
My name is Jean Girimana. I do kids work in Rwanda um, with a ministry called Discipling the Next Generation. We are trying to resource the Church of Rwanda with uh, well-equipped children's workers. Um, I went to Cornell because I wanted to be more equipped so that I can be effective in my ministry uh, back home. I am very, very grateful for the training I received at Cornell, uh, particularly for all the lecturers who patiently listened to all my talks, uh, which were not so good, uh, but they were very happy to listen and they would give me very great constructive feedbacks. Sometimes I would get right to passage, the big idea in the AM sentence, other times I wasn't. Uh, I remember one day going to see Neil Wattingson, the director of uh, International Student at Cornhill. I was very discouraged because I wasn't seeing enough progress uh, as I was longing for. Uh, and I told him how I'm finding it difficult to write um, the talks and to give the talks. <laughs> And Neil told me this, he said, um, don't be discouraged, don't, don't give up, keep going. It, it does take time, but you will get better. Today, I have started to see fruits uh, of that exercise in my ministry. Uh, we are writing lessons for parents to help them teach the Bible to their children at home. And because we are writing for parents who mostly have little knowledge of the Bible, uh, the first half of, of the lesson designed to help parents is like five minute uh, Cornhill talk uh, we, where we help parents to uh, get right the passage to understand its main point and to be able to apply it to their own lives first before teaching it to children. Neil was right, I am, I am slowly getting better and yes it still requires time and hard work but I am seeing good progress and I am very very thankful. Um, for, for the training I received at Cornhill. Please be praying for us. Uh, pray for the work of discipling the next generation and pray for random parents uh, that they will find joy in reading and teaching the Bible to their own children.
Our reading is taken from 2 Kings chapter 18, reading from verse 19. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On who do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed? saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Come now, make a wager with your master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able to, on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain amongst the least of my master's servants? when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen. Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, please speak to your servants in Aramaic for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of you his own fig tree. And each one of you will drink the water of his own system until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath, Arpad? Where are the gods of the Sepharvim, Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hands? Who amongst all the gods of the lands has delivered their land out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But the people were silent and answered him not a word. For the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the house, and Shebna the secretary, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. This is the word of the Lord. Feedback can be quite painful. I remember a friend of mine asking an older Bible teacher for some uh, feedback on one of his Bible studies. 
and the older guy said to him, hindsight is a wonderful thing. How do you think it went? And my friend said, well, to be honest, I think I totally messed up the, the study. There was no real structure at all. And the older guy said, that is fair. Anything else? And my friend says, well, I didn't think we really landed anywhere. There was no sort of application to people's lives. That is also fair. However, neither of those was the main problem with your study. I always remember that. That was an example of, of a bit of a car crash in terms of uh, feedback. But it can be helpful to do a post-mortem just to find out what is it that went wrong so that the next time around we don't make the same mistake. And that is a bit like um, what One and Two Kings is there for. So the book was um, first published when the people of Israel were in exile in Babylon. And they would have read it with that kind of where did we go wrong question. And um, how do we get ourselves into this mess? It started so gloriously in the days of Solomon when every man sat under his fig tree and every man had his own vineyard. It was a time of great prosperity. And now here they are hundreds of miles away as slaves to the Babylonians. Where did we go wrong? And it's partly in the Bible for that reason, for them, and partly for that reason for us, how do we not make the same mistake, but also so that we can see the great difference that the Lord Jesus makes to the situation. Let's delve in together and we'll start at the beginning of chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Um, all the kings get a little intro like this. They tell you some facts about them, how long they reigned for, um, who their mothers were sometimes. And this is the author's way of telling us this is real history. He's narrating exactly what happened. And at the end of Hezekiah's reign in chapter 20, we get another little postscript. Chapter 20, verse 20, the rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit, he brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now, this is quite exciting for me because I've had the privilege of going to Jerusalem three times just um, to look around some of the historical sites. And if you get a chance to go after all this uh, travel restrictions are over, I would really recommend that you go to Hezekiah's tunnel. And you can actually walk through it. It was a tunnel that he used to divert the water supply of the city from one side to the other to make it more secure under siege. And you can actually walk through with the water up to your ankles. And it's an amazing bit of engineering because for half of the tunnel, the pickaxe marks are going one way. And then suddenly halfway through, the pickaxe marks start going the other way. And you realise they tunnel from both sides and met in the middle. How did they do that? I mean, it's amazing. But um, the point is, this is real history, a real king. Uh, and in fact, the events of these chapters took place, we can pinpoint the date, in 701 BC. And the other thing that the author tells us in the intro is that Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That is a big thumbs up. In one or two kings, we get these little summaries of the king's reign and they enable you to play, if you want to, um, Bible King Top Trumps. In fact, one of my friends even made a set of cards for them. And you can give the different kings rating for things like how long they reigned for, um, how horribly they died and all this kind of thing, um, and whether they're good or evil. And Hezekiah, he's good. He does what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. David, that great king, in verse 3. But then the author goes a bit further and tells us why Hezekiah was so good. Chapter 18, verse 5. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. So there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. In other words, if you are playing Bible Kings top trumps and you got the Hezekiah card, then the category to go for is faith. Hezekiah, faith, 100 points. It beats every other card. There was no one like him for faith, for trusting God before him or after him. And we see that Hezekiah was a man of great faith in this particular situation because faith is tested in a crisis. Maybe you feel that at the moment with all of the terrible things that have happened around the world this year, the coronavirus outbreak, the, the race riots um, in America. And in the middle of great pressure, faith is tested. This is a story of great pressure. In chapter 18, there is a, a battle. Um, let me read to you from verse nine. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, 
Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. At the end of three years, he took it. That's actually a flashback. We've read about that already back in chapter 17. But the Assyrians came in and swept away the northern kingdom of Israel and erased it from the map. Um, and then a little bit later in Hezekiah's reign, they turn up not just in the north, having conquered the north, they show up in the south. Verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, they have great names, these Assyrian kings. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So he sweeps away Israel. He then sweeps away all the cities of Judah. In fact, if you go to the British Museum, you can see a frieze depicting the siege of La um, Lachish. I always think of it like the French pastry, um, the French lunchtime snack, um, the quiche. But the quiche was wiped off the map along with all of the fortified cities of Judah. There's one city left. It's the city of Jerusalem. And Sennacherib's army comes and surrounds it with 185,000 soldiers. And this is a moment to test faith. And you can see the outline of where we're going just on the sheet if you've downloaded the, the booklet. But if not, let me um, give you the quick outline now. Uh, we get two cycles of three speeches. The Rabshaka, he is the spokesperson of the army of the king of Assyria. He speaks first and then Hezekiah replies and then Isaiah the prophet speaks. And then we go through again. The Rabshakeh speaks, then Hezekiah responds, and then Isaiah speaks. Very carefully put together. And we're going to go through these cycles together and we're going to see how faith is tested. So we begin with the Rabshakeh. And I said about the Rabshakeh on there on the outline, the Rabshakeh undermines faith. Let's look together at his speech, which begins down in verse 19 of chapter 18. Verse 19, the Rabshakeh said to them, say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? You see, there's the issue straight away. He's attacking their trust. What do you trust in? What do you have faith in? And then he begins to undermine it. Verse 20, do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust? Verse 22, if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, come off it. This is not a time for faith, we've got an army outside and you're just going to rest everything on a God that you can't see. And so the Rabshakeh brings this sustained attack to try to undermine Hezekiah's faith. And it might be that as we go through it, you'll recognise in the Rabshakeh's words some of the same attacks that the secularists of today use to mock those who trust in, in the living God. Let's go through some of his strategy together. Well, I've picked out um, eight different stages in his propaganda war. And we'll just look at some of them um, very quickly, some of them in a little bit more detail. So verse 19, he begins by saying, I'm um, sorry, verse 20. Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? The trouble with faith is all you've got to go on is just words, just this Bible, this book, whereas we've got an army. How ridiculous to trust in words. Of course, there's a great irony here because the Rabshakeh, is actually the propaganda machine of the king of Assyria. And all he gives us is words. I mean, he would be the Goebbels of the ancient world. He's a mastermind in propaganda. But with one breath, he's saying, all you're trusting is words. And with the other breath, he's using words to attack. And we know that our parents were lying to us when we went to school. And they said to us, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That was a lie, because of course, words really can hurt you. And these words of the Rabshakeh really can damage or undermine Hezekiah's faith. Um, next argument, verse 22. If you say we trust in the Lord, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed? Now, at this point, the Rabshakeh's theology isn't quite bang on because he's noticed that Hezekiah is destroying idols and he assumes that God will be upset about that. All these religious objects he's taken away. Actually, we know that God is quite pleased about that because he hates idolatry. But anyway, the Rabshakeh doesn't uh, really understand Israelite theology or true theology. Verse 23, the next one is the, the carrot, the bribe, albeit mixed with a bit of sarcasm and mockery. Verse 23, come now, make a wage with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able to set riders on them. 
It's a bribe, you know, I'm willing to give you lots of horses, but it's also a little mockery. Um, if you've got any cavalry, oh, you've only got five people in the cavalry, well, that'll be just five horses then, so it won't cost me much, will it, to help you out? It's a kind of bribe, but with sarcastic flavour to it. And then number four, and this one we're going to linger on just for a moment. Number four, he then claims that God is actually on his side. Verse 25, moreover, is it without the Lord that we have come up against this place to destroy it. The Lord said to me, go up against this land to destroy it. Now this is a, a very sharply barbed arrow. And um, God sent me, God's with me, not with you. It's, of course he's, he's trying to play at both sides, isn't he? On the one hand, he's undermining faith in the Lord. But then on the other hand, he says, but if the Lord's on any side, he's on my side. Now, ironically, there's a kind of truth to that, as in the fact we'll see later, the fact that he managed to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, it was actually the Lord he sent him, but he doesn't know that. He's just using it as an empty piece of propaganda. But it's a bit like when the secularist today says to us, says to the church, oh no, God will be on our side. You know, God is pro-equality. God is pro-love, whatever the love might be. And so people actually take a moral argument or even a sort of pseudo-Christian argument against the Christians. No, no, God's with us. And that maybe they can find a, an archbishop or a professor of theology to agree that the secular view is the right one. And the Bible-believing Christian one is, is profoundly anti-God. The Rabbi tries even that. Number five, let's move on. Uh, that number five really is just uh, the brute, the bully speaking. Verse 27. Um, you're doomed to eat your own dung and drink your own urine. And that's pretty black and white, isn't it? There's going to be a siege. You're going to have nothing to eat apart from your own feces. Uh, and then uh, as, as soon as he puts the boot in, he then turns to sweetness and light again. Verse 31. Don't listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat his own vine, each one of his own fig tree. You'll all drink the water of your own cistern. And the idea of having your own fig tree, I don't know if you tried to plant one in your garden, but in Israelite terms, this is the equivalent to you'll all have your own private jet and your own yacht on the lake. And I mean, this is, this is to be a millionaire, to have your own provision uh, of wine and figs all the year round, your own water supply. I mean, this is luxury. And he says, I'll be the one who gives you that. See, this is the subtle attack on faith. It's not just saying stop believing, Instead, it's saying, believe in me rather than believing in God. I'll give you an alternative source of blessing. You trust God to bless you. And of course, once they had had, in the days of Solomon, great prosperity, their own fig trees, their own vineyards, and they'd lost all that. I'll be your saviour, says the king of Assyria. I'll be the one who gives you that blessing again. And you can see how concrete it looks because the kingdom of Assyria is very prosperous and they've got fig trees and vineyards and soldiers and armies. And what are you trusting in Hezekiah? Your whole kingdom has been destroyed. You've got one city left and you're trusting in the words of a God that you can't see. And that leads us into strategy seven, verse 33. Religion is empty. Verse 33, has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his hand out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hama and Arpad? I mean, where are they? I mean, it's a point well made, isn't it? I mean, who are they? Have you ever heard of the, the god of Harpa? I haven't. Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the land have delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. He's saying, you see, religion hasn't got a good track record against actual armies. Just look at all the other religions of the world. They haven't fared very well. What makes yours so different? Maybe you recognise some of those same tactics as the secular world mocks those who trust in the Lord. The Rabshakeh undermines faith. Secondly, Hezekiah, his response, Hezekiah exercises faith. First one of chapter 19. As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. Now, this is a characteristic way in the Bible of expressing extreme anguish and distress. And I would do it now to demonstrate, but I rather like this shirt, so I'm not going to. But just imagine I were to go 
and rip my shirt to shreds. That is a way of saying I am very, very upset. And of course he is. He's very distressed because there's 185,000 soldiers. So what does he do? He covered himself in sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. He goes into the temple. Now in 1 Kings chapter 8, we discovered that the, the great truth of the temple is it's the place where God will hear. It's like a telephone box that connects you. I mean, I know we cannot, can't remember what those things are, but before mobiles, we had telephone boxes and the temple was like a kind of ancient telephone box. That was the place where God said, you'll get straight through to the heavenly switchboard if you pray there. And so he goes straight to the temple and he exercises a kind of faith. Um, I'd like to say he goes to the temple and he prays, but that's not quite true. He goes into the temple and he asks Isaiah to pray. Verse four, he says, um, lift up your prayer, Isaiah, for the remnant that is left. Maybe the Lord your God has heard. It's a bit like when um, one of your friends who doesn't know the Lord asks you to pray for them. They kind of know that you've got a connection with the man upstairs, as they put it. And they say, well, would you pray for me? It's not really personal faith, but it's, it's a step towards faith. Maybe God can help. Could you ask him? Um, and then the prophet Isaiah comes and he speaks to strengthen faith. The rapture cut undermines faith. Hezekiah, to an extent, exercises faith. But then God's word comes in through Isaiah to strengthen faith. Verse five, the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah and Isaiah said to them, say to your master, this is what the Lord says. Don't be afraid because of the words you've heard. Again, it's this propaganda war of words. Whose words are you going to listen to? Don't be afraid. The words you've heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumour and return to his own land. And I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. There's a great irony here because the Rabshka says, oh, you're just listening to mere words. But it's actually going to be mere words, a rumour that's going to send him back with his tail between his legs. In fact, we read about that in the very next section as we come to the Rabshaka again, the second time round the cycle. Verse eight, the Rabshaka returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. He heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning um, uh, the king of Cush. Behold, he sent out to fight against you. So he sent messages again to Hezekiah. In other words, a rumor back home, Cush is attacking and it sends him running. But he's got one more go one more chance to attack Hezekiah. And so we go round again. He again tries to undermine trust. And we had seven propaganda styles last time. This time we just got one and it's the gloves off, verse 10. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. I mean, wow, that is strong, isn't it? If you trust God, you're a fool because God is lying to you. There's echoes, aren't there, of the Garden of Eden. The Satan says to Adam, if you can't trust God, he's bluffing, he's lying. Faith would be gullible because God is untrustworthy, he says. And then he repeats his list of all the other nations that he's conquered. Uh, then we go back to Hezekiah. And you might ask, why are we going through the same cycle twice? We go, Hezek we go Rabshakeh, Hezekiah, Isaiah, Rabshakeh, Hezekiah, Isaiah. Why the second time round? I think it's because that it's all very well to stand a, a short test of faith, but it's really difficult when the test lasts for longer and it's persistent and the, the chipping away of the secularist mocking you little by little by little undermines you. But actually, in Hezekiah, it has the opposite effect. Rather than him having a little bit less faith, in the second time round, he has a little bit more. Instead of asking Isaiah to pray for him, sort of praying second hand, he prays himself. Look at verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, and this is a wonderful prayer. He says, O Lord, the God of Israel enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. You're not my little parochial God. 
You are the God of everywhere because you made everything, he says. And then um, incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. It's urgent pleading. Lord, please notice what's going on here. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. And then comes a, a key theological insight of Hezekiah that sweeps away the Rabzika's most poisonous arrow. Verse 17. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire because they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us. Hezekiah makes a distinction that the Rabshakeh didn't. The Rabshakeh lumped all religion together really annoys me when people do that and they say oh, of course you're a religious person aren't you as if I believe the same as a Buddhist or a Muslim or you know all throw them all together and Hezekiah makes a distinction oh no there's a difference between the gods that you conquered and my god the gods that you conquered were made of wood and stone that's why you destroyed them whereas my god the true god the living god is the god who made heaven and earth it's a stupid analogy, but let's imagine when you were a kid, you loved the Lion King. Probably not too difficult to imagine because I know lots of you did. You love the Lion King and every birthday you ask for a fluffy stuffed lion soft toy, a little Simba. But there's a school bully and every time you take um, your new Simba birthday present into school, the bully rips it out of your bag, tears the head off, pulls all the stuffing out and you cry and you'd go home and you're... Uh, your mum sews the head back on and so on. Um, and you're just used to your toy lion being destroyed by this bully until one day you go on a school trip to London Zoo and you go to the lion enclosure. And the bully says, oh, I'm pretty good at feeding lions. You know, I've got your Simba so many times. And you say, oh, in that case, why don't you climb in? And you offer to go and find a ladder and you're really hoping that the bully will climb in. Because of course, you know, there's a big difference between a stuffed toy Simba and an actual lion. Well, it's like that distinction, but a hundred times more. Just because you can beat fake gods, don't think it's the same thing when you come up against the living God, because he says, now, O Lord, save us, please, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Hezekiah continues to exercise faith in the face of the undermining, the mocking of the world. And then along comes Isaiah, finally, to strengthen faith even more. Just as the Rabshakeh has mocked God, so now God, through Isaiah, mocks the Assyrians. Verse 21, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning the king of Assyria. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. The, the picture is of Jerusalem pictured as a, a girl giggling at the, the foolishness of the king of Assyria. Here he is with 185,000 people, and like the big school bully coming up to you to grab your Simba. But the little girl knows that her big brother is a lot bigger than him, and she just laughs. <laughs> really? I mean, just wait until you meet my brother. Yeah, you'll be running between your tail, between your legs, won't you? <laughs> the giggling, the mocking of a schoolgirl, or or maybe it's not a little girl, maybe it's a, a beautiful older um, girl, a young woman, the virgin daughter of Zion, and it's like she's putting down someone who's come up to ask her for a date who she thinks is way beneath her. Like, no thanks, I'm sorry, I'll be washing my hair. In fact, I'll be washing my hair every day, so don't bother, thanks. <laughs> and the shame as the blood rushes to their face as they realise they've no chance against this one. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice, lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. You picked the wrong fight this time, mate. This is the living God that you are dealing with. And by the way, you know when you said that the Lord sent you, when you were trying to claim that God was on your side rather than Israel's side as part of your propaganda war? Well, ironically, it was kind of true, but not in the way that you thought. Verse 25, haven't you heard? I determined it long ago. 
I planned it from days of old, what I now bring to pass. You see, you're just a puppet in my hand, King of Assyria. And I can send you back the way you came. Verse 28, because you've raised against me, your complacency have come into my ears. I'll put my hook in your nose, my bit in your mouth. I will turn you back the way by which you came. And then in the end, faith undermined, exercised a little bit by Hezekiah and then strengthened by the word of God. And then again, faith undermined and exercised a bit more as Hezekiah begins to trust more in the living God and then strengthened as Isaiah comes in. Then in the end, faith vindicated. It was the right thing to trust God, not mere words at all. Verse 35, at that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all the dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home. He ran off with his tail between his legs. He lived in Nineveh. And as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, i.e. a god of wood and stone, a fake god, Adramalek and Shazreza, his son, struck him down with a sword and escaped into the land of Aram. And Urshaddon, his son, reigned in his place. The end. A vindication of the faith of King Hezekiah. And so here are the exiles reading this story and thinking, well, he was a good king. Unfortunately, not every king was like him. If we kept having rulers who trusted God, we might have been okay. Unfortunately, his son Manasseh was an evil king. And so we went into exile and here we are in Babylon. They look back wistfully in the days of Hezekiah and they think if only we had a Hezekiah who lived forever, a Hezekiah who would never have to hand on the throne to an evil king. We, we want a king who, who trusts God, but we need an eternal king who trusts God as they were longing for something secure and different. And of course, as we read it, we know exactly who that eternal king is, a, a very Hezekiah-like king. A king who, like Hezekiah, had faith in God that was challenged and undermined, this time not by the Rabshakeh, but by Satan himself, as he was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. And actually some of those tactics were exactly the same. You remember how the Rabshakeh offered, I will be the one to give you blessing. You can all sit under your fig tree and have your own vine from me. That's exactly what Satan said to Jesus, isn't it? I can give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will worship me. Don't trust God, trust me. But the Lord Jesus, like Hezekiah, the greater Hezekiah, he does trust God. He trusts his father. He commits himself. We read in 1 Peter, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. The Lord Jesus is a Hezekiah-like king, but a king who never has to pass on the reins, an eternal Hezekiah. And even as we can put our confidence in Jesus as our great king, we're called to imitate Jesus. Jesus is not only our saviour, but our example, and our example of faith. And so we come back to this passage and we say, well, here's the same, the test that the Lord Jesus passed. Here is the test that the Lord Jesus showed us how to pass. As our faith is undermined, will we continue to cling on, strengthened by the word of God? I've summarised it this way. When faced with a Rabshakeh, will you do a Hezekiah strengthened by an Isaiah? Or to put it another way, when your faith is undermined, will you keep trusting? strengthened by the word of God because the Lord Jesus did he trusted his father to the very end let's pray heavenly father we thank you so much for this faithful king Hezekiah thank you that he trusted you and that you gave him this great victory at a time of crisis and we thank you Lord for the greater Hezekiah the Lord Jesus who in an even bigger crisis the, the crisis of the whole human race continue to trust you and delivered us and we pray lord that we would be like him help us to imitate him when our faith is mocked and undermined help us to hold on and we pray that your words such as your words through the prophet isaiah would strengthen us and keep us to the end for jesus sake amen 
every Christian should be reading biography regularly. Christian biographies show what God can do when a life is dedicated to him. Good Christian biography shows what it is when doctrine comes to life and is worked out in, in the day-to-day -day living uh, for the Lord Jesus. It also shows us what it is when faith and works come together. It shows us the trials and triumphs of the Christian life. Good Christian biography teaches us what it is to run the race set before us. I think as ministers, as Christian leaders, as church workers, we should be regularly reading biography. One, we demonstrate to our congregation the value of it, but it also equips us as we seek to show others what it is to live for Jesus. Countless illustrations, countless examples to point others to. I want to recommend three uh, biographies uh, that would be good for us, but good to recommend to others as well. Theologians of the Christian Life is a really good series uh, that picks out theologians, looks at their stories, and then analyzes uh, both their life, their doctrine, their practices, their vision. Tim Chester has written an excellent new one on John Stott. How do you uh, condense all of that John Stott achieved in his life into one single volume like this? Well, Tim's done an excellent job of sharing his story, sharing his beliefs, and then critiquing it and, uh, and reviewing it to see what, what it is that we can learn. And Kwashi, many of us will know him and perhaps a little bit of his story, a remarkable book uh, that's just come out of, of his story, particularly in his uh, ministerial work uh, out in Africa. It's challenging, it's moving, it's uncomfortable in places. But Ben Quashie's Neither Bomb Nor Bullet is well worth reading, learning from and putting into others' hands. And then finally, a new edition called Sketches of Faith, which looks at 33 characters from Christian history, right from Bible times through to today. And for each one, it gives you a little precy of their story. There's a, a beautiful sketch for each one, a timeline, and very valuable as a sort of coffee table book to give you a a little glimpse into their lives. It'd be valuable for uh, a gift, perhaps somebody in your congregation, or for us as preachers seeking to get illustrations or a little snapshot of people's lives. Sketches of Faith by John Woodbridge is well worth getting. Now you can get all of these individually or buy them together at, uh, at the link below and you'll get a very special price. Hi there, my name's Denzel, um, I'm 24, um, I grew up in South London and uh, I was born to Christian parents, I was raised in a Christian household. We were made to attend church every week and um, the churches I attended were charismatic Pentecostal churches and even though that's where I first heard about Jesus, uh, Jesus wasn't the primary emphasis of those churches and um, what was more emphasised was things like or were things like uh, the gifts of the spirit, uh, healing, the prosperity gospel and so on. And there wasn't really a, an authentic view um, or teaching of who Jesus was and his work for us. Um, when I was 13, I, that's when I first heard the gospel. And from then on, I believed it. I believed in his death and res resurrection and uh, his effectual work for me and his elect on the cross. And... Um, Ever since then, I've, my life has been in submission to him um, and I'm currently serving at my church in, uh, in Lewisham called Ecclesia and if there's anything that I would like prayer for, um, it, would that, it would be that the Lord would be leading me and my family uh, as I pursue pastoral ministry. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.
The Proclamation Trust exists to help people unashamedly preach and teach God's Word, the Bible. We believe that this is the most important task in the whole world. It's through the faithful proclamation of God's Word that the lost are found, Christians are nourished, and churches are edified. We've all benefited from the ministry of the Proclamation Trust in one way or in another, and by God's grace, we want to see it continue and thrive and expand. We have exciting plans to train many more people for word ministry through our Cornhill training course. We want to enhance our support of people already in ministry through our conferences and resources. We want to maximize the opportunities that digital media presents and be generous to other ministries, both in the UK and around the world. God has been so faithful to the Proclamation Trust over the last four decades, providing resources to enable the ministry through generous gospel partners. Now, in 2020, we are more determined than ever to seize new opportunities and redouble our efforts to equip and encourage people to keep on preaching and teaching the Bible. We would love you to partner with us in this vital work. You can give by text or via our giving portal on the website. You can give a one-off gift or commit to regular giving over the longer term. Please give what you can and be assured that all money that is given will be used to equip and encourage Bible teachers on the front line of gospel ministry. Thank you for your ongoing prayers and partnership. Hi, this is Devanshu Sandhu from New Delhi, India. I was at Cornhill last year, had an amazing time. Before coming to Cornhill, I was serving as a deacon and youth leader at my church. And also I had a desire to reach out to rural area pastors and church leaders in northern India, uh, especially helping them in the area of preaching because uh, many of them don't get any formal training and never even heard about expulsive preaching. So I praise God that he gave this opportunity to me be able to come at Cornell and get some training uh, from uh, many godly men. Those who really helped me to understand how to prepare an expository message, help me to see the importance of seeing the text in the context and, uh, and how to apply that passage to myself and to the people I'm preaching. So yeah, so since I've come back, I've been involved in passing on whatever I've learned to brothers in rural part of India, helping them to see the importance of expository preaching for the congregation and also how to prepare an expository message. Uh, so yeah, God has been really good and faithful helping me to establish this ministry here. Uh, few things to pray for, pray that I would remain faithful to the ministry of word uh, as God has uh, given me this ministry here and also how to go about it, especially for wisdom after the lockdown end. Uh, to continue the ministry as I travel around Northern India. Thank you very much. God bless. This coming academic year from September, we are excited to offer the first year of Cornhill online. So in this coming year, you can join us for Foundation Year One, wherever you are, without any need to travel into London. This is partly response to the current crisis, but something that we are glad to embrace and make the best of. Cornhill Foundation Year One can be a standalone course and will be useful to you no matter who you are. We'd love you to apply, we'd love to meet you, and if you want more information and to find out how to apply, visit the Proclamation Trust website. Hello, I want to commend to you a new book that's just out from IVP and in these strange days that we're in at the moment where there are no events and no conferences, this is part of a virtual launch. The book is called Essentially One, Striving for the Unity God Loves. It's an appeal 
for us to share God's passion for true Christian unity and to repent of our ungodly divisions. And I know of no one better to write such a book than my friend Jonathan Lamb. Jonathan's had wide experience all over the world of Christians in very different settings, cultures, traditions. And he speaks from his experience of working with IFES and Langham preaching, Keswick Ministries and in local church ministry. So he speaks from a long experience, knowing some of the great joys of Christian unity and some of the great heartache and difficulty of working together with other believers. He's a very clear Bible teacher, but he's also got great practical wisdom and pastoral good sense. And all of that is combined in this excellent book. There are searching questions at the end of every chapter. So this would be a good book for home groups to use, maybe leadership teams to use together and think about. I commend it to you very warmly.
We're so sorry for our technical difficulties getting these sessions online uh, today. We hope you've now been able to watch the first two and a very warm welcome to this final session of the final day of the Evangelical Ministry Assembly. Indeed, a really very, very warm welcome indeed from a very sunny London where we've turned the air conditioning off in order to reduce the amount of background noise if we start pouring with sweat or falling off our chairs. Um, apologies. And um, this is our question and answer session. Thank you very much for all the questions you've sent in. I'm joined by Andrew Satch to try and answer some of them. First and fairly general ones. Um, first of all, the speakers are operating at a very high slash academic level. Uh, I couldn't do this. And if I could, my congregation couldn't cope with it. What am I supposed to take away from these sessions? Oh, gosh. Well, a few things to say. Uh, firstly, these are meant to be expositions for ministers. So we wouldn't preach to a church the same as this so um, we're trying to be stretching and to um, push ourselves to think harder um, these are things we worked at for a long time so um, I guess an EMA sermon you know I've been thinking about two kings for a couple of years and this is what I've got to so it's not my first go at something and lastly I think with the passion of the bible it's not like it's not like a darts board where the bullseye is worth 50 points and the rest of the darts board is worth zero you know if you don't absolutely hit the bullseye then your sermon's worthless I think you know you could hit just off the bullseye and it'd be worth 40 points and hit the edge of the darts board that'd be worth 10 points I mean it is possible to miss the dartboard altogether and you could say something that was so wrong that it was of no value to congregation but uh, I guess all of us uh, the more we look at the bible the closer we're getting the more we're discovering and our sermons get better and better but they're never perfect and if we're faithful to the lord they're never useless Thank you very much. Um, what is the first thing you do when you come to prepare a sermon? Um, ideally, I would start a long way beforehand and just try to enjoy the book of the Bible to get to know it myself before I was thinking about a sermon I have to preach for it. Because I think the, the feeling of the gun to your head, this is for Sunday, I have to understand it now, uh, is difficult. Whereas I will enjoy the book of 1 and 2 Kings and, and learn from it is very enjoyable. So I think if you can build in enough time just to get to know the book long before you have a message that that's a help um, and then I would try to just read it as often as I could and um, my experience is that passages that are unfamiliar are complicated and passages you've got to know become simpler just by familiarity so I try and read it once a day as I said earlier and I read it prayerfully and ask God for help um, talk it through with other people I think studying Often, often I'll look at a passage in a Bible study with a group or something before I have to bring it to the pulpit because other Christians often have insights that will help, those sorts of things. Someone has asked, I find Old Testament narrative tricky to preach on, for example, compared to New Testament epistles. Have you found similar? Uh, what has helped you in your preaching of Old Testament narrative? Yeah, I feel, I feel differently now. I think it's one of my favourite parts of the Bible. But again, I think it's probably familiarity. So... The more you preach narratives, the more you'll enjoy them and the easier it will get, I think. There's other genres I'm more scared of. I'm quite scared of apocalyptic. I've never preached the end of Daniel or um, I've preached bits of the book of Revelation and found it quite challenging. But I guess the more I preach Revelation, we're planning a series for later in the year. I hope the more I preach it, the easier it will get and the more I'll enjoy it. So I think partly it's familiarity um, and it's just learning to treat different parts of the Bible in a different way. So with the narrative, you're looking for the contours of the storyline and you don't have to really think of illustrations because it is, a, it is a story by itself. So we just got to get better at telling the story. Whereas if we were teaching a epistle, we'd be looking for the logic of the argument. With the story, you're looking for the suspense and surprises and turning points of the story. So it's just getting familiar with different genres of the Bible. Should we go to Jesus in every sermon or study? It seems like we could run the risk of every sermon being the same or fitting Jesus in when he's not directly talked about. Um, I don't think, you don't want to make it a test that every sermon has to pass. You know, did, what, did you mention Jesus? Um, otherwise it's a fail. I mean, not every passage of the New Testament mentions Jesus, but Jesus mentioned a lot and it would be very surprising if he didn't come up often but I wouldn't make it the test of he must be every single paragraph or every single sermon um, but I guess what helps us is that the Bible by itself is a Jesus centered book and the Old Testament um, prophets um, were looking forward to the Messiah to come so it's not like we're having to add Jesus in 
um, already there's a Jesus directed flow we're expecting a Messiah we're looking forward to a promised Messiah that Messiah is the Lord Jesus so a matter of tuning into the book on its own terms should take you to Jesus probably not every sermon but often often you say Old Testament prophets are looking forward to Jesus um, do you mean that section of the Old Testament called prophets would you include Moses the prophet in that <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to the Messiah. Thanks, Stephen. yeah thank you what I really mean is all the Old Testament the law and the prophets and the writings the whole thing Good answer. Question five. Although we see how the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ, how do we preach the Old Testament passages message and not just the message for the New Testament, the, new, the message from the New Testament fulfillment? Yeah. Um, I think it's, you want to spend most of your time in the passage you're teaching. So we saw that Jesus is the ultimate eternal Hezekiah, but most of the sermon I preach was about Hezekiah in the Old Testament and I think that's true even if everybody knows at the beginning of the sermon who it's about I don't think you have to unnecessarily keep it in suspense but let's imagine you're teaching Isaiah 53 about the servant who is pierced for our transgressions I mean most Christians know that's about the Lord Jesus so you don't have to pretend it's not until the last sort of ultimate reveal but even if you say at the beginning of your sermon, well, we know this is a prophecy that is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus, but let's now learn about the Lord Jesus from the details of Isaiah's prophecy and then do most of your sermon from Isaiah. So most of today's sermon was from Kings, even though it's Kings as it points us to the Lord Jesus. As the senior minister of a church, how do you seek to grow in your preaching? Do you get feedback from anyone? How does that work? Yeah, I'm in an unusual situation in that we have two senior pastors at Grace Church Greenwich, um, and so I share the preaching with Andy Latimer, and we make a practice every single week of giving each other feedback on our sermons with our ministry trainees. And the rule is you always have to say something positive, and you always have to say something that can be improved. And I find that really helpful because when there's a crit from the other Andrew, it's not a personal thing, it's just that's the rules, you know, there has to be a crit. So it, it, it's an easy way of, I think if I, let's imagine I always say, oh, Andrew, that was a great sermon. And then once a year, I say, I'm not quite sure about this. That would seem like, you know, it's devastating. Whereas every single week I'll say, this was great. I wasn't sure about this. And he'll say to me, this was great. This could be improved. I think that's really good. And if you haven't got a staff team, then maybe you could join with other pastors in your area and listen to each other's sermons and give feedback or I think it's, it really helps us to improve. Um, I think we're always learning just because the Bible's a big book and there's lots of parts of it that I haven't explored yet. And so every new sermon series is like a new training course for me as well as it is for the congregation. On Tuesday, uh, we were thinking particularly about understanding a passage in the context of the melodic line of the book as a whole. Yesterday, we were thinking um, particularly about trying to focus on preaching in line with the uh, intention of the original author. Perhaps a bit less of a theme today, but I guess we were thinking particularly about structure. You mentioned that quite a few times mm -hmm. um, in how you understood the passage. So a few questions on kind of structure. Are there downsides to having a really structured talk? Might you miss the flow of a story by trying to sort of break it up into headings like that? I don't think there are downsides if the structure of your talk is the structure that's in the text. I mean, if you if you impose the structure that was very artificial on a story, you could mess it up. But if your structure is the author's structure and we're actually following the contours of the story, I don't think it should spoil the storytelling. Um, I mean, sometimes I've done sermon outlines. We, we print out an outline for people. Um, in church and sometimes I've an outline why I haven't wanted to put the last point down because the whole point is it's a real surprise and there's a twist and you weren't expecting it to go that way and it feels a shame if somebody can straight away arrive at church look down and you've given the game away so sometimes I've had point one point two and then point three dot 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 just to keep us in suspense but I think an unstructured talk is very hard to listen to and actually the bible itself is very structured and um, because it's a it helps the listener helps the reader how do you find the structure of a passage then? Yeah, I mean, again, this is a dependent on different genres of the Bible. So in an epistle, it might be looking for stages in an argument. Um, in um, a narrative, it might be looking for different scenes. I sometimes say to people, imagine you were making this as a film and you had that, what they call clapper boards or something, you know, where you write with chalk, scene one, and then go bang. You know, how many times would you need to do that? Where is there a place where you change scene? 
Um, or maybe in this case, it was a change of character. And I just noticed that we went through Rabshakeh, Hezekiah, Isaiah, Rabshakeh, Hezekiah, Isaiah. Um, it's partly noticing the markers that are there in the text itself, that are the clues to the author's structure, and then breaking it where he breaks it. Uh, in this case, he spotted two cycles of three kind of speeches. Is that a common kind of structure that we should be looking out for? There are other kind of um, shapes that we should generally on the lookout um, for in different genres. What difference does that make? Yeah, I mean, I think shapes is a, is a good way of describing it. And sometimes people put less of the alphabet to describe different kinds of things. So today would be a A, B, C, D, B, C, D. A structure so it has the A and the A at the end the bookends and then the cycles B C D B C D um, and if you do it with less of the alphabet you can get all kinds of patterns I mean sometimes bits of the Bible are a contrast where you'll go A B A B A B so think of Peter denying Jesus while Jesus is on trial in John's Gospel and the camera lens continually flips back between Jesus inside the high priest court, Peter outside, Pe Jesus inside, Peter outside. That would be an A, B, A, B. Sometimes you get, this is a favourite of those on the Cornhill court training course, you get a chiasm, which is like a big multi-level sandwich, an A, B, C, D, C, B, A structure, all sorts of things. But again, what all you're looking for is the shape of the text as the author has structured it, and you're trying to discover that and reflect that in your own structure. And then what's the significance of that, having found it? You spot the chiasm or whatever it is, what do you do with that? D does that map directly onto the structure of your sermon? Um, is there more to it in terms of understanding what the author is saying through how he structured his, his material? I, I think of prep as sort of two, preparation as sort of two stages. Um, stage one is just to notice as many things as I can. And then stage two is to ask why. I think what is the point of that? So. Noticing the structure is not the end of your work. You know, you just, you spotted something, but who cares? And then you've got to think, well, why might it be like that? So in the case of Jesus and Peter, I guess it's a contrast. And John is showing us Peter is the person that Jesus is dying for. He's a substitute for him. Jesus succeeds and Peter fails. Um, in the case of two kings, why go through twice? Well, I'm suggesting it's because faith is harder if you have to keep waiting and as the tension grows. Although, ironically, it turns out that Hezekiah's faith grows rather than lessens as he has to wait. But you're looking for some kind of progression. Um, so notice the thing, ask why the thing's there. Um, what is the purpose of the author? And, and that goes for everything. I mean, I talked about repetition, trust, 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 trust. Okay, you notice it, but then you say, but why is that there? I think, oh, it looks like actually that's a lens onto the whole thing. But in general, spot the feature in the text and then ask the purpose of that feature. Um, are you allowed to miss verses out? Uh, is that still expository? I mean, you have to, don't you, if you do a long section, otherwise people are going to be there for hours. Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, if, if you don't miss verses out, you have to only preach very short passages. And I'm suggesting that it's good to take, a, in this case, a whole two chapter sweep because it's a bigger story. Of course, you shouldn't ever miss a verse out in your own pre preparation and your own reading because you're trying to see how it all works. But then to summarise it without going to every single bit, I, th I think is fine. I mean, the New Testament, when it quotes the Old Testament, summarises and picks out verses. And you wouldn't say, oh, you're mishandling it. It just makes sure that it picks out the right verses to summarise it, which is what we're trying to do as well. And when it comes to reading it, uh, how much of the passage would you have would you have read on a Sunday morning and why? Yeah, I think people struggle to, I think congregations struggle to listen to long readings until they start to understand what they're about. And if you tune out, it's, it's not very useful. So we tried to keep readings fairly short. And probably what I would do, I mean, what I did today was to pick a few verses that are representative of the whole thing or a few verses that help to introduce the whole thing. And then I know that in my sermon, I will fill out the rest of the story. But I certainly wouldn't try to read two chapters worth of, of two kings in one go. I think a congregation would just struggle to, to pay attention for that long. Uh, Someone says, thanks so much for the exegesis and exposition. If you were teaching the parallel passage for Isaiah, how would your sermon differ? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? This is maybe the only narrative in the Old Testament that we get almost verbatim three times so it comes in two kings it comes in two chronicles and it comes in isaiah and it's almost word for word the same i think it's the same as 
what you would do when you discovered a passage in Mark's Gospel has a parallel in Luke's Gospel and in Matthew's Gospel. Um, and the best thing to do in that situation is not to sort of average them all out and make some sort of hybrid, but to think what is the distinctive voice and purpose of each author in recording this. So Luke might have a particular take on something, Mark might have a slightly different take on the, on the same thing. And I think that's true of King's Chronicles, um, Isaiah. Um, there are little differences. I mean, for example, um, in, in the bit that comes next in chapter 20, we, we hear about Hezekiah showing off his treasures to some envoys from Babylon. And this is very foolish, it turns out, because they're about to invade and attack and carry it all away. And the author of Kings doesn't really point out that Hezekiah is being stupid. He just points out the exile's coming. Whereas in Chronicles, the author of Chronicles says that Hezekiah did it because of the pride of his heart. So if I was teaching Chronicles, I would talk about Hezekiah's pride. And if I was teaching Kings, I, I wouldn't talk about his pride because I'm being guided by the author about the particular things that they underline. And I guess Isaiah will have his own way of integrating this story right into the middle of his prophecy, which will be different to the plot it pays within the narrative of, of Two Kings. I mean, it's partly made easier for you because if you're doing an expository series, if you're doing a series on Isaiah, then when you get to this passage, the themes that have been prevalent in your Isaiah series will come to the fore. If you're doing a series in Two Kings, the themes that are prevalent in your Two Kings series will come to the fore. So partly doing series will, will tune you into the author's purpose automatically. Uh, thank you so much for clear exegesis and exposition of the chapters for the really helpful application to us. What do you make of chapter 18 verses 13 to 18 when Hezekiah gives away the gold from the temple and so on? How does that affect how we view Hezekiah's faith in the Lord? Yeah, um, so Hezekiah sells off some of the gold and I basically missed it out of my um, sermon. And I think I'd do so again because you can't say everything. Um, but let me say why. Um, the, the getting rid of the gold is something that happens progressively all the way through to Kings. So they get the gold um, from the Exodus as they plunder the Egyptians and then they get more gold in the days of Solomon where people are bringing tribute into the city and you know billions of pounds worth of gold coming in every single year. But then from the glory days of Solomon all the way through um, one or two kings, as the nation's in decline, they lose the gold. And it comes to a climax right at the end of two kings where um, in chapter 24, they get rid of the last of the gold. In chapter 25, they just sell off the bronze because that's really all there's left. So you notice that theme and it doesn't really play a major part in any one of the chapters but cumulatively, it turns out to be a big thread. If I was doing a, well, I just have done a, a series in One Two Kings, I'd save it till the end. And when we get to chapters 24, 25, we'd say, wow, they get rid of the last of the gold and the last of the bronze. Actually, it turns out this has been happening all along. And then I would trace back and see the thread. So it's sort of what you do with, it's a bit like with box sets, isn't it? Or with um, series on Netflix. You know, you have a main story and then there's a, a little, sub theme that that traces through just the one scene in each episode that adds up something else i think it's a bit like that it's hard to do justice to it on a hezekiah sermon but you could trace the theme when you when you pull it all together at the end of two kings oh one other thing on that um someone said what does that mean about hezekiah and is it a bad thing it yeah i guess it probably is a bad thing but again i'm trying to be guided by the author because the author always gives his evaluation of each king of Israel and Judah. And he tells you how long they reigned for, were they good or were they evil. And the author tells us very clearly Hezekiah was a good king. Um, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David his father had done. There was no one like him who trusted in the Lord his God before him or after him. So I don't want to make my own evaluation of Hezekiah that's different to the one the text gives me. The, t the text says Hezekiah thumbs up even though I might find things that, well, that isn't quite thumbs up, is it? We didn't get that quite right. No, he got it right, is the overall summary um, of him. Uh, thanks for a great talk. If the application to them then was, you need a better forever king, how can the application for us be, um, be like that king? Um, well, I think, I don't think I'd put them um, at odds like that, either or. Um, they needed a better forever Hezekiah king, and we've got one, and I definitely want to say that in the sermon, as in the fact that the Lord Jesus is like Hezekiah because he's a king who trusts God, Jesus trusts his father, but different from Hezekiah because Jesus lives forever. So whereas Hezekiah gave them 15 years of safety, 
Jesus gives us forever an eternity of, of safety. I definitely want to make that point, but I don't think we just have to stop there because I guess eventually if the punchline of our sermons in the Old Testament is always, and we need a king like Jesus, and we've got one, the end, um, after a while the congregation is going to tune out because we, we know that it's about Jesus. And I'm suggesting that having got to Jesus, you don't then stop your work because, has, because Jesus is both the king and he's the model. And the New Testament calls us both to trust in what he's done for us and then to copy him and imitate him. And I'm suggesting that then gives us a lens onto Hezekiah where we say Hezekiah is pointing me to Jesus, but I want to copy Jesus. And so in this respect of his faith, I want to copy Hezekiah. Um, so I think you can, I think you can do both, um, point people to Jesus and yet then pick up the path that Jesus walked that he calls us to follow, the path of trusting God. Here's a good question for our internet age. Is it right for Christians to mock our opponents? Uh, yeah, somebody asked this when I, I preached um, this passage at, at church and somebody asked the same question. And it's a good one. I think we've got to be careful because there are all sorts of motives in our hearts for mocking people. And many of them are ugly, horrible things. Like I want to be, um, I want to win the argument. I want you to think that I won. <laughs> That's just a pride thing, which is, which is horrible. I need to repent of that. But I think there is a place for um, laughing at the empty philosophy of the secularist or mocking the devil in his schemes. And the Bible does it quite a lot, actually. It's particularly in 1, 2 Kings. There's lots of comedy here. Um, I mean, the famous one, I suppose, is Elijah on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, mocking the prophets of Baal. You know, they're trying to get Baal to light the barbecue and... Um, Obviously, Baal doesn't exist, so nothing happens. And he goes, come on, cry louder. You know, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's gone to the loo. And Elijah's clearly mocking them. And Isaiah here is clearly mocking the Rabshakeh, the king of Assyria. And I think when you go looking in Jesus' teaching, you find there's a lot of humour at the expense of his opponents. You know, when Jesus says, um, when you're about to take the... Um, you point out the speck in someone's eye, first take the plank out of your own. I mean, that is a ludicrous image, isn't it? Somebody with a, something the size of a shed in their eye, take that out first. I mean, Jesus is using humour to say, don't be so ridiculous, you hypocrite, and um, notice your own faults first. So I think there's a place for mockery to deflate the proud, um, the, uh, the proud rebel against God and the arguments that rail against God but we've got to guard our hearts to make sure I'm not using it so that I win, because that's more about me glorifying myself rather than glorifying the Lord Jesus. Uh, you said that the temple was like a telephone box where God would hear prayer. Isn't the temple's primary function as a place of sacrifice? I think it is actually more about prayer, but maybe we, well certainly when, when I used to read the Old Testament, I had an oversimplified sort of connection. So every time I saw the word sacrifice, I thought it was a reference to Jesus' death on the cross or being fulfilled in Jesus' death on the cross. But I now realise that there's different kinds of sacrifices in the Old Testament. It's a little bit more nuanced. So there was the sacrifice of the burnt offering or the sin offering, which were about dealing with sin. But then there were sacrifices of the fellowship offering, which are about enjoying the relationship with God, like having a meal with God once you're reconciled to him. So it's a little bit more nuanced. And I think it's the same with the temple and the tabernacle. So um, in the tabernacle, there's lots of references to atonement and the need for cleansing for people, for God to live in the midst of a sinful people. But in two kings or one, two kings, the picture is slightly different. And the temple, the thing that's emphasized about it is the place where God will hear. Now, of course, both are true, right? So there are sacrifices at the tabernacle, at the temple, and you can pray at the temple. But within Kings, it's the prayer function of the temple that is emphasised. And you'll see if you read 1 Kings 8, the seven prayers that God would hear prayers. So, Lord, when we pray towards this place, then hear in heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. So it's set up as the channel by which heaven and earth are connected. And so I guess Jesus then fulfils it in a slightly different way. Jesus fulfils the sacrifices of the burnt offering, the sin offering, by his death on the cross, um, but Jesus fit, fulfills the, um, the communication channel as he opens up prayer in his name between us and the Father. So yeah, it is about sacrifice, it is about prayer, but there's slight nuances of it, and that's the one and two kings nuance, I think. Last question, that felt like a lot of material for one talk. Could you break it into two or three talks? 
Yeah, I think it probably was too much material. And for example, having preached it, I now think maybe I shouldn't have done every single one of the Rapshaka's propaganda strategies. I could have just picked a couple. Um, n normally sermons benefit from being thinned down rather than stuff full of stuff. So yeah, probably too much stuff. Um, you could split into more than one sermon as long as you showed how they fit together into one story arc because the story is two chapters long. But it might be, for example, that you give people the overall story and then say, but this week we're going to focus in on the Rabshakeh's tactics. And this week we're going to focus in on Isaiah's response. But having seen how it fits as one whole story um, each week, you could do that. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And uh, thank you very much indeed to Andrew. I'm feeling pretty challenged after three days of really uh, meticulous and uh, insightful and thoughtful exegesis. You've obviously thought a lot more about these passages uh, than I have. Um, I think I'm encouraged too. There's one or two things there that, that I could um, learn from, things that I can pick up and keep working on uh, so that my teaching is increasingly faithful and uh, increasingly glorifies the Lord Jesus. So thank you very much indeed for all your hard work, Andrew. Hasn't that been great? Thank you for being with us. We hope it's been a really helpful morning. This is the end of our first EMA online conference. Please visit our website to keep up with all the latest news, events and information about the Ministry of the Proclamation Trust. Perhaps you might book in for one of our conferences, enrol in Cornhill, buy one of our books or join us for one of our special day training events. Let me pray to close our conference. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that we've heard these three days. Thank you for reminding us of the powerful effectiveness of your word. Thank you for the encouragement, the stimulus that these three days have been for us in our own preaching to work harder at studying your word, to seek to proclaim it faithfully. We pray that you will send us out from these three days ready and bold to preach the word in season and out of season. Make us bold heralds of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Every blessing as you go from here to continue to serve the Lord Jesus. It's been a joy to have you with us. Usually at the end of the day at EMA, we would offer an exit book, a book that you can get for one pound as you throw a quid uh, by the door and, uh, and you take the book away. It doesn't quite work online in, in quite the same way as you leave your living room and throw a quid in the corner and you nip off to get a cup of tea. But we do want you to get some good books for just one pound. We've picked three this year that you can buy together, three for three pounds. The purpose of these books are to introduce you to them for the first time, or perhaps you already know them and you want to get them in bulk to give out to, to those in your church or to sell in your church. We don't even mind if you make some money on it. So this year, we've got three books for three pounds that are available as you check out um, uh, at tenofthose.com as you make your purchase. The three are Willing But Weak by Paul Williams, Need to Know by Gary Miller, and Beyond the Big Sea by Jeremy Marshall. Willing But Weak is a brilliant little book with 18 short chapters looking at the issue of self-control. Whether it's screen time, the tongue, what our eyes are looking at, what our minds are thinking about, anger, all sorts of different areas where we need self-control. And not often is it talked about in Christian discipleship. Paul Williams' book, Willing But Weak, is brilliant and designed to be read together uh, as, as a whole church congregation. Gary Miller's book, uh, Need to Know, is a simple introduction, really, to what it is to live the Christian life. It's not complicated, but he just sets out very plainly what it is to live for Jesus. That is normally six or seven quid. You can get it in this bundle for a quid. And then finally, Jeremy Marshall, many of us might know his story, diagnosed with cancer, terminal cancer. And he's written his story of how he has faith and hope in the midst of great despair. 
It's designed to give to those who aren't yet Christians, to explain the good news of Jesus, the hope that we can have even when facing death. Again, available just as a pound in this bundle, but with the idea that we get multiple copies and sow lots of seeds and who knows uh, what fruit might come of it. So get these exit books, throw your three quid in the um, checkout and get hold of them, use them, distribute them widely and pray that God would bring life uh, through the word.